two words that I'll share first that are powerful and the words how and the words yet. Anytime you think you cannot do something, just play out that phrase, you know, like instead of saying, you know, I want, can I go buy this property? Can I go start this business? Instead of that, say, how can I go start this business? And, and psychologically and for goal setting, that matters. It matters more than I, I ever thought it would. Hey, what's up? Welcome back to another awesome episode of Life in a Show podcast. I'm your host, Jason Wojo. On the podcast, we help people work less, make more, and live awesome lives. I'm joined by Polish Peter, my co-host. So today we're going to be talking about some golden handcuffs. So we're going to be talking about some transitions. We're going to be talking about some business growing opportunities. And uh, and we have a great yeah. guest that actually walked the walk and talked the talk and what thing. And that's the Best kind of a guest that we can have on here, dude. This is an, I love this episode. We have Spencer Hillegas on the on the show, and he's super smart, younger guy, early forties. Uh, here he here he was working in in the Silicon Valley, um, tech startups, all kinds of cool things. Yet he realized very quickly uh, that this was not the path for freedom in his life, both in terms of his finances and his time and provide, prioritizing the things that are most important to him. So we're going to kind of get into like, how did he make that jump from a career in, you know, with, with the golden handcuffs, like Peter mentioned, into creating something for his family that served him rather than sacrifice his life. And, and listen, if you're listening right now and you're like, well, I don't have a, a high income job like Spencer, I still want you to tune in because he talks about, I asked him a specific question, like, what do you do when you don't have capital, when you don't have, you know, a high paying job? How can you still create freedom for your, for your life, for your family, for your loved ones? And so we get into that as well, man. Lots of nuggets in here. Yeah. And he also talked about setting goals. Um, I think there's some good nuggets that he dropped about when it comes to setting goals, creating that the day for yourself. He talked about something called calendar. And towards the end of the episode, I had to say it, Vojo asked him a question that was pretty good. Ah, uh, man. But yeah, but he brought up two words that I want you to listen to. I two words. That will probably have a really good impact for you to we'll create that goal. And yep, to moving forward. Yeah. So listen to the whole interview. You're going to love it. Here's our interview. Here's our discussion with Spencer Hillegas. Spencer, what's up, man? Welcome to Life in Your Show. Jason, Peter, honored to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Dude, I love your story. You know, we had a chance to catch up uh, not too long ago. It feels like a little bit. Um, but you had such a, a powerful story that I knew our listeners and our, and our viewers would benefit from because I think it's one that many people have. And in particular, like I want to start off with kind of like this, the, what I can kind of consider like the golden handcuffs experience where you have a you have a good paying job, providing you with financial security, making the money you want, but like life, like something's missing, like something feels off. Like tell us about that. And then let's talk about how you started to achieve and pursue financial freedom and how life looks so different now than it did before. Yeah, and thanks again, you know, for having me on. I felt like we were really able to connect on our last conversation, Jason. So I think, um, I spent 13 years in Silicon Valley tech companies, you know, as a kid who grew up playing in bands and, you know, thinking I was pretty punk rock. Uh, I never planned on going and starting a management career, a leadership career, but five tech companies later, uh, you know, my wife, Jennifer and I, who is now the COO and co-founder of both, both our family and our business, she and I had been working full time, you know, for 13 years up until about 2019. Um, and we both were sitting there making great income. Bay Area, California, and worked, worked our butts off, you know, to climb corporate ladder, get promoted. You know, I, I was uh, building big teams and companies like Intuit, uh, you know, QuickBooks, TurboTax, you know, most, most folks know those names. And uh, ultimately, once we got to this certain stage, uh, it, we were like dumping money into our 401ks, making great W-2 income. We bought, somehow managed to buy a house in the Bay Area uh, years ago, and we felt like we did it, right? Um, and ultimately, we were grinding. Um, and I remember like a distinct moment. This is, um, I think it started around 2018. And I was working for the, the most intense startup that you can imagine, you know, culturally, I was putting 80 hours a week in. Um, and it, you know, there's kind of this unwritten Silicon Valley uh, lottery narrative that a lot of people know about, you know, you want to join a startup, maybe get a chunk of equity, be part of the next Google, Uber, you know, Facebook, what some big exit that somehow absolves all your financial sins along the way. Um, and in the end, 
that was, wasn't panning out. And, and we felt like the more we climbed, the, the more we made, but also the less time we had for our kids. And so there was a period of time, two weeks or so, I uh, didn't see our youngest for like two weeks because I was going in so early. I was coming home so late. And it really was like the catalyst, you know, the spark where it was like, so, you know, so, something's got to give. Um, and that's when I started really getting the bug to, to think differently and researching. And, uh, you know, ultimately there's so many different wonderful directions we could take it from there. But we started to look at investing differently, not just dumping money in 401ks, not just maxing out our W2 income. We wanted to put our capital to work because we had saved up well, you know, and so we started to invest passively in a bunch of different ways. So hold on, though. I want to back up for a second, man. What was that like not seeing your kid for two weeks? Like how, like what, mm. what was that like? And, and, and I'm sure difficult certainly is not a word that can even describe that. Depends which kid, right? Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're not wrong on that one, depending on the week, right? <laughs> but, but, you know, but this is when one of them was very young, you know, and, and, and those, that, that, that time is so fleeting. You know, any parent can, can, can knows that very keenly. Um, and when you feel like, hey, you're going in, you know, putting the, the time in, putting your best work in, the sweat equity, and then you're not able to actually reap the benefits of that by connecting with the, you know, the family that you're growing, that's brutal. It, it's brutal and it's taxing and, and the grinding feels like you're kind of on an endless treadmill, you know, call it a rat race as we all know, but uh, it, it was brutal. And um, I know clearly in the bigger context of the world that might sound lofty is a real challenge for some folks. But for me at that moment, that felt really hard. And I think uh, hard on Jennifer as well, right? I mean, we both were working hard uh, and, and, you know, sustaining our family, et cetera. And so just wondering where's the off ramp, you know, like, like where's the off ramp from this lifestyle? Where, where's the priority where my health was not getting any focus? I mean, Jennifer's the same at the time um you know how do you go and say well, we're going to go do this for the next 20 30 years this way you can't you know it's not sustainable how do i show up as a father um you know be present and excited to see them when i do come out of that two-week window uh if i'm not feeling healthy and present and well slept and all that stuff so it was hard jason to say the least well man and i'm wondering did you tell yourself or like hey man you know it's because I'm, I'm wondering like the reason i'm asking this is i think a lot of people are stuck on a similar experience or on that similar ride but they keep telling themselves like oh it's just a season it's just a season it's gonna let up it's gonna get easier like and i just gotta stick it out but you it sounds like you had a and i don't want to say an early realization because you were you were in there for a while yeah but yeah. but what but but at, at some point and i'm guessing that the, the whole 13 years weren't like that and it probably it, it probably no. had you know and so but finally you reached this breaking point and so what did that look like for you guys so so mm. how did you guys and by the way Silicon Valley, I mean, most people would be like, oh my gosh, it's a dream job. And this is my like career goal aspirations. And yet you're, you guys are recognizing like, this isn't what we want. Like that, that had to be kind of like a little bit of a tug of war. Like, gosh, like what is going on here? Maybe even, maybe even like disorienting. Like I remember when I, and I had a job for the uh, contracting for the Navy and spent 15 years in school to get that job. And all of a sudden I realized this isn't what I want. Like it can be very jarring. Mm -hmm. And so how did you guys actually navigate that decision? And now with, 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 with a family, like that, that could be scary. Oh gosh. I love that question, Jason. And, and thanks for sharing that about the Navy path as well. It's, it's, you know, for me, when I was going through that headspace, that challenging headspace, I sat there and you hit that point of just to say it bluntly. I mean, you hit that point of desperation right? Of like the quiet desperation. And I think that that's a different way I'm hearing what you're describing because so many people out there are going through that now, absolutely going through that right now. Um, and I think for me, just it, what it came down to at that moment, I'm grateful for this as ironic as it sounds, but tech, the tech industry is pretty ruthless when it comes to uh, age. <laughs> you know, and people can't see, you know, I'm, I'm 41 now, you know, I'm not saying I'm really long in the tooth or anything, but uh, that makes me uh, uh, relatively ancient when it comes to some tech companies, some early stage tech cultures. And wow, okay. I, I don't I don't think this is taboo to say anymore these days. Maybe it was about 10 years ago. But um, when you start seeing that and you start hearing that and picking up those vibes, as it were, in companies and, and you're sitting there going, well, where does this end? Like, where does this end in 10 years, 20 years? Because the work culture is not built for people with kids. There was a time where I was the second... Uh, oldest person in a company, I was at that time, I think like 34, maybe wow. 35. 
you know, so uh, those tea leaves that I was attempting to read at that moment were absolutely part of it. Because in the big picture, I really think there's two big, uh, there's a push and a pull for every major decision in life. You know, one of my former mentors mm -hmm. kind of helped me understand this construct, right? Something is pushing you away. You know, it's not pleasant to, to deal with. And that's what I was feeling in that moment. Like this career is great, but either I keep going up this ladder, I keep pushing up more and more responsibility, less time, more, more friction, or perhaps I look at a different path. I don't know what that path is. And I had to figure out what that pull is. I knew what the push was. I didn't want to be aged out. I didn't want to be grinding and I needed a way to get more family focus, more health focus and more time. Um, and for more of a financial moat around my family, because God forbid something happened to me, you know, uh, it, it's a crazy world out there. And I, you know, my, my, the income for our family, uh, was top of mind as well. So that, that was really the headspace I was in Jason. And I really appreciate you asking about it because in the end, uh, the writing was on the wall very plainly for me at that point. And I, I was fortunate enough after on my fifth company, uh, that I was working with, um, a mentor led me into the, this one place that I was brought in to, to turn around a team hire a bunch of folks on a loan origination group, you know, that we were helping fix and flip, uh, fix and flippers get loans for these homes. And I watched a couple of these guys, younger guys than me that I managed, they reported to me and they would work amazingly hard, great, great team members. Right. And they would put time in after everyone went home. It's like five o'clock and they stuck around. They stuck around like two hours, sometimes three hours until it got dark at night. And and I was like, what are they working on in that room over there? <laughs> you know, it was a cool culture. And, and in the end, I bring this up because I saw, ultimately I found out and they, they told me about it eventually that they were building their own business. And, and it, when you see people that you, you relate to day to day, you know, when you actually talk to people and you're like, I know this person, I know, I know what their strengths are. I know what they're working on and know how they think enough because they've shared it with me. It makes it so much more tangible as as a hey, can i do this you go from that headspace of can i go do this thing to how can i go do this thing um and and that was a big eye opener for me is like just literally seeing people that i knew firsthand interacted with daily and deeply respected that i that i technically managed but you know i just try to serve as a servant leader and seeing them pull that off and go off and build a company uh was like wow okay there's a different way to go do stuff yeah man so listen, so I'm, I love what you're sharing so far, because one of the things that you share, like I'm, what I'm hearing is like there's golden handcuffs, been in it for a very long time. Now I'm having these realizations, right? Of when I'm seeing what's possible. And, you know, there is this, first you mentioned earlier, like I need that off ramp. So my question to you is um, how you get off that ride, because it probably is kind of scary in that moment, because I think a lot of people deal with that, right? So I'm curious for you, like, how you get off that ride? What's the next step? What'd you do? Yeah, my goodness, getting off the ride. I wish I could say it was like a clear cut blueprint. Here's every step that I yeah. took along the way, right? Um, hindsight, it, it seems so clear, but uh, you know, at the time it felt like hacking through decisions with a figurative machete and just trying to find your way. Um, so at that time, we had saved up some capital because we were working hard. Uh, you know, we had also been fortunate to buy a home early. So we had some home equity we could tap when interest rates were more favorable. So we had some resources, right? And, uh, but at first, at least I knew from mentors, mentors basically were like, don't go do anything stupid. Go get some education baseline, go read, go talk to people, get out there and network. And I, I was fortunate to be working in the guts of a, of a real estate focused lender. Right. And so I could see something like the numbers and the, the economics the financials behind some of these transactions that were happening inside of this company. And I was like, as a guy who's serving these real estate investors on the other side, I was like, how do I get involved? Cause I, I see how many zeros these folks are making, but I can't swing a hammer. Like I'm not handy. I, I rely on YouTube every day, Peter. Like I, I have to go and figure hey, out. And, there's no shame in that dude. It's you know, all good. And, 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 and Jennifer, I'm very at ease with this. I mean, Jennifer is way handier than me. So I'm like, I can't go flip a house, but I want to go figure out how do we start investing and somehow get into uh, real assets, you know, and, and invest in stuff that produces cash flow. Uh, because, you know, index funds, you know, the stock portfolio, we had that going. Um, so what do we do? Like, 
we start, I read 24 books in an 18 month period. I listen to 400 podcasts. So they don't great education, much like the stuff that you guys do on your show here. Um, I didn't need to do that much. That's procrastination after a while. Right. Uh, but I, I eventually went out with Jennifer. We drove around a whole summer just to find one rental with our kid in the car. And we bought a very overpriced, uh, duplex here in California, only property we've ever purchased for real estate investing purposes in California. But that was a good learning experience, you know, paying 430 grand for a duplex uh, and getting $200 a month in cash flow. Um, that we call that phase one. Phase two, we got comfortable buying some rentals long distance. Uh, we did that in the Midwest. We, we got up to five properties, five single family rental properties in the Midwest. And doing this full time, I'm, I'm doing this uh, while I was working full time leading teams. So I was getting up at 4 a.m just to go do the job before the job is how I thought about it in my mind. And it, it, I think once, once I locked into those goals and Jennifer and I had set these goals together as to how do we, where do we want to be? Where do we want to be in five years, seven years, 15 years, you know, it made it much clearer. Like, Hey, the, the, the nine to five job going in and working hard, getting W2 income is good. If I, if we want to make a change, we want that off ramp. We want to build this thing. I have to do some Herculean big effort in a different way than I've ever done it. And I don't know what headspace I was in at that point to pull it off, but you know, you get up and uh, you work in a way you never have before. So I was doing, you know, two hour work blocks before work every day and going in and leading teams. Uh, and then ultimately we got to the point where we started investing a little differently and even got more active in our, and built a business around something. We never planned on building a business in the first place, but it started out as a passive investor buying rentals, buying them locally, buying them long distance, and then ultimately building a business around that. There was a lot of stuff that happened in between, but uh, the, you know, that was the whirlwind version of learn, <laughs> over-educate, and then start taking action. And then ultimately just working, um, working my butt off to go and educate myself by talking to other people and getting into an industry that I understood some of, but not much. And so I really had to get into it. So how has your business evolved since then, man? Since you, you, so you started off, you know, the local, you went to the 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 Midwest for the remote stuff like what do you what do you guys focus on now yeah I think the wonderful learnings that we got Jason about investing in rentals is that uh they're really good for long-term wealth building but they're not really good for being fully passive if you have a busy life you know even we have property managers on those properties that we own um and on the rentals we own and we found out they're semi-passive at best you still get stuff you have to deal with you still have to deal with you know tenant turnover and stuff so what did we do? We started putting money into bigger deals and structuring partnerships where we're like, hey, we started investing five and six digit numbers of our capital into bigger deals and funds with other teams that have been doing this for years. Because I was like, I'm not going to move. At this point, we have deep roots in, in this area. We're not moving to the markets where we want to buy property. <laughs> and we know the economics are so good. You know, you can go find these amazing like cash flowing deals that can over time stack up to replace your income. But I'm not going to move to Texas uh, at this point. I'm not going to move back to Colorado. We lived there for a decade. Um, we're here now. So how do we do? What do we do? We find killer teams that have been doing this for many years. We vet them the same way we would for our own money because we put our own money in with them. And we built a club where like we find those teams and we put together a group of our investors and somehow somehow people just started asking me, how do you go do what you do when you're vetting these folks? You know, and I'm like, well, I get on a plane and I fly out and I put them through this five part vetting framework. And, and that's what we do. And we decide if we're going to put our money into them. Um, that became a business. And now hundreds of people uh, ultimately trust us and invest alongside us in these types of deals for, you know, uh, different types of real estate, you know, so, you know, self-storage facilities, apartment buildings, um, you know, like some, some private equity stuff, you know, like that, that is never in any way the master plan we started with, but it became something organically because people trusted us and wanted to, to lean on the expertise. Man, I love that. I, I love the evolution of it. And, uh, and so I have a question, man. So this is something that I got to tell you, it's, it's, it's a, it might be a difficult question for you hmm. because it's not your experience, hmm. but there are people who want to similarly get out of their job that do not really have a lot of capital yet, or, you know, they, they, and, and by the way, obviously hearing you speak, you know, you're highly intelligent and some people feel like, Hey, I'm not as smart. Uh, I'm not as smart as Spencer and I can't do this. And I have all these obstacles in my way. And, and there's all these reasons they can't make it happen. 
do you have you ever helped anybody like that or do you have any advice for someone on that mm -hmm. path who and and again like this is kind of an unfair question to ask you because this isn't this wasn't your path but i'm curious if you'd have any advice for the people that are in that situation um you know trying to trying to make their way towards freedom as well yeah i mean i, I embrace the question jason i really appreciate you asking it too because uh i take those phone calls all the time you know for people in my personal network you know, friends and friends and friends of friends, and sometimes folks that just reach out and ask that question directly to me. Um, I have very clear thoughts on this at this point, which is that, you know, within the world of investing in entrepreneurship, sometimes folks will say, oh man, you know, I don't like that W2 job, I don't know, the corporate world. And I know we, we opened talking about like how hard it was for me in that specific period of time. But in the big picture, the first decade of that career, I, I do cherish the majority of that. You know, so I bring this up because if I could go back in time and talk to my younger self, and if someone is out there at the same position I was at, where like I had credit card debt when I was young, you know, I had I had too much fun, even though I made good income when in my early twenties, or if someone's in a place where they're starting with little to no capital, what I would still do is find a way to go generate active income in a way that you can do over a period of time. You know, just and that could be a W two job, that could be starting an online business that that could be doing a side hustle that could be so many things but i still really believe that like if a person doesn't have a job that they can sustain and do over a period of time it's still a good foothold i mean it, like, you got to start there you also learn skills in that in that uh in that area in that career uh where you can actually go and, and transfer that you know so many of the things that we use in our business were skills we directly learned both jennifer and i in our careers you know and and those those relationships that you build in a company, in a, you know, in, in, in any types of like straight of service business, any type of uh, work you're doing, you build relationships with people. And over time, that does come back around positively when you have a pay it forward mindset and you, you try to add value to other people in the world. So that diatribe all basically means active income is a good start. Um, I think beyond that, setting a long horizon goal. So Jennifer and I, uh, we sat down and we said, okay, we want to change our lives over the course of X amount of time, right? Trying to figure out what that number was. Our starting circumstances were different, but I would do this the exact same way. If I could go back in time and talk to myself when I had a bunch of credit card debt and no assets and no capital, I would say, I want to hit this goal or this amount of income within this many years. And the reason it matters is we set a 15 year goal initially, which sounds absurdly long to most people. But that's the ultimate excuse killer. You know, like when someone sets a goal, if you if you are set a goal, we say, I'm going to go and make a million dollars in six months. I mean, that's pretty unreasonable for most people. If I say I'm going to go make, uh, you know, an income of, you know, 10,000 bucks a month, and I'm going to give myself 10 years to go do it. Well, that sounds quite a bit more reasonable. And it changes the way that one goes out and starts taking action, setting goals. And so I know that might sound lofty for some folks. But frankly, that's the right starting point still. Like, I, I really believe that. So I think getting active income, setting a clear goal over a right time horizon that removes excuses. Um, and then finding someone who can help you, like someone who's one step ahead of you on the journey, you know, like, like they don't have to be, you know, if, if you're sitting there with no capital and you're just wondering, how do I get help? I would strongly encourage folks to go out and seek out um, a coach or a mentor. I mean, I've, I've absolutely used four different coaching programs, no five over time. Um, there's so many wonderful ones out there, of course, do your due diligence, you know, but, but like, I think that investment is, is something I has been worth it every single time. Um, so, you know, once you get some stabilized income, you get some form of goal setting, and then you also find some sort of like, uh, guidance, but you have to seek out the guidance, make sure it's a good fit for those goals. Then you're, you're going to have some choices ahead of you, but it does take, I don't want to make it sound like it's easy. It takes hustle, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> right? It takes hard work. And on that topic of hustle and the period where you were kind of essentially like, I don't know, I know it's, I don't know if it's called moonlighting when you're up before your job and after, or if that's a different right. phrase, but yeah. there's a period of like extra hustle. How do you avoid, because the other problem I see happen with people that do decide to go into business for themselves is they end up working just as much at their job because now mm the fear and the uncertainty of a new business and it's on me and that steady paycheck is gone and they just kind of like they they accelerate the amount of work they're doing like how did you overcome that let, let me get back to you on that one no, no. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah no I, you know 
all authenticity and integrity intact i think um it's been a journey you know it, it's, it's it's been a journey i think um one thing i've noticed that i relate to with every single literally every single person who i've watched go from a high paying high demand w2 job you know a lot of which in tech companies that you and i would both recognize right you know like whether it's apple google and then there's a lot of folks who have, who have built amazing careers and they say hey, let's go build a side hustle that does this or that or the other they leave that job and they work like a maniac absolute maniac and they 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 give it every so much more effort exactly what you said Jason. so much more effort than you can imagine and they ever gave to their core job at their company and uh i can relate to that in the first year after i left and went full time you know and so in five months before COVID hit this was like in i think october 2019 that's when i was like hey our business had reached the point where it was too much like i, I couldn't do both anymore i, I couldn't show up well in my leadership job at my day job and do that with my integrity intact knowing that i was still putting in that that moonlighting as you said in the morning in the afternoon and the weekends and lunch breaks and etc so uh I, I went out and i worked my butt off right after that and um over time though i think i have the strategic advantage as i'd like to think of it in that my co-founder is my wife um i don't think that's for everybody and i'm not saying everyone should rush out and go do that working with your partner your spouse is something that is a deeply personal thing and completely depends on your own situation it's not going to work for most people but for me that means every time that i sit there and i say what's my trade-off do i take on this project or do we as a family go on that camping trip <laughs> i mean that's been my experience and i think if i really wanted to say how do we flip life on its head more positively from a work focused uh, you know, daily priority uh, to put it in kids first, you know, marriage relationship first, health first kind, kind of lens. Um, it, it's, it's really binding our business and our, our family together in, in, in a way. But that has taken, you know, we've been doing this now for over seven years. Um, and, and so I think that that has been a journey. And it's a lot of conversations, a lot of learning how to communicate together. Um, thankful for having the language of business from two separate careers because i think that that has helped us in a lot of ways for both jennifer and i but again i wish that playbook was more helpful for folks who don't necessarily have the ambitions to go and work with your spouse but at least for us that you know that that has been um challenging but even more powerful on the positive because it means that i have to rein it in when i say oh let's scale to the moon no how about we don't scale to the moon how about we actually go build a life of meaning and intention i love that man i mean I love that, man. I love what you're sharing here because one of the things that I'm hearing from you talking about it is that there is a why behind what you're doing. There is a, you know, like this idea, why am I doing this? Um, you know, goes back to when I first started, you know, creating my own business is, you know, the kids and, and family and those kinds of things was. And, and for me, ultimately, what ended up happening, I actually started working more in the business and that why I was kind of going bass backwards kind of a thing, right? Yeah. Um, and I think the priorities and when it comes to your action, I think very important to show the fruits of that why, right? Yes. So I got a question for you because someone who's sitting on here on this podcast is listening to this right now and they are going from whether it's a corporate job or they have a W-2, whatever it might be, and now they want to get to being their own boss. They want to you know, have that financial freedom. They want to be able to not have those handcuffs or whatever, transition. Through your story, everything that you went through, what would you say to that person as they're sitting here right now? What kind of advice would you give them? Yeah, I would start with uh, defining what you think, as corny as it sounds. Like, start with defining your ideal day. I mean, I can't get away from that. I've heard the term vision boarding. I never thought of it that way. But for me, it was a deeply powerful exercise to do that right off the bat, Peter. Like, literally saying, okay, open up my Google Calendar. Look at how my calendar looks today. Mm -hmm here's how my Google calendar, I want to look in 10 years from now. And people will say, well, how's that going to actually help me? It'll help you because that will drive a series of behaviors and decisions over time. And that is literally what I did. I said, okay, from two, where was I at? Well, I was waking up 4 a.m., taking a bus into the city to work real hard. I was literally working end to end all day. I want my days to involve some focus on health. I want to take my kids to and from school. I want to be able to go and have a meaningful interaction or multiple meaningful actions with my wife and my spouse. I want to hopefully have some time for connection outside of that meaning with friends, community. And ideally, 
some form of uh, philanthropic or charitable efforts that are mixed in there, right? And if those things are all part of my future state, um, I can inform the decisions and actions I take from, you know, from A to B. And in the end, that would be the first step because it's easy to skip. It's tempting to skip, right, Peter? I mean, like, pe- oh yeah, it's scary because you're sitting there going, I have to be held accountable to going toward this thing now. As soon as you put it down on paper, you're like, wait, I can't cop out. I can't make up an excuse for this anymore. So that, you know, that would be the first step. The second step, very specific, but I think people glaze over this. Um, I literally pulled out a blank calendar when I was trying to say, how the heck am I going to find time to work on this thing? I had the goals and I, I was like, Hey, block out all the time that's already spoken for all the family stuff, all the work stuff, all the working hours. And I had found 10, 10 hours at that time. And anyone should go out and just sit there and run that exercise as dry as it sounds. You can't skip it. <laughs> you just can't skip it. Like find that available time. Um, I, I sacrificed, of course, and other people have to do that too. I mean, these are quite mild sacrifices in the big context of the world. Of course, I stopped, uh, you know, binging on Netflix. I stopped, uh, you know, I, I love playing guitar. I've been playing guitar for like 25 years. I stopped playing that for a good year to two years, you know, and, uh, all those hobbies, all those things, I didn't have a chance to go out and do happy hours, you know, like, like all those things where people think, oh, I have no time. I'm like, I, I guarantee that you have time. Um, it's just about the tra- the trade-offs. It's about the opportunity costs. And uh, ultimately, can I, can anyone, can I tolerate putting away an Xbox? You know, um, you know. I think ultimately, one of the places of inspiration that I drew from early on was, you know, and this is I'll keep this quick. But I grew up in a uh, an entrepreneur household. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my dad was a real estate broker for thirty years, and. That was really cool in some ways because I actually got pulled in to see what that was like. That was the one income family situation. He was uh, pulling me in to do stuff as a teenager and as a kid. I was cleaning out houses that were going to go for sale, you know, cleaning out fridges. I was going, doing open houses. And ultimately, I bring it up because I saw him wake up at 4 or 4.30 a.m. every day and thought, what a crazy guy. Like, why? I'm never going to do that. Who does that? That's silly. And here I am doing it, right? Mm. But what was also interesting at that period of time was I got to see what happens when things don't go well as an entrepreneur for a period of time. He was flying high. He was like in the top five real estate brokers in the country for uh, back in the nineties. We had a good lifestyle as a family for a while, but then we hit this period of time uh, in our family, we call it like the dark decade. Uh, and like I lost my younger brother to cancer uh, as a teenager. We lost like two grandparents right after that within like a matter of months. Um, anyways, I won't go, too grim here for people, but I'll just say that that had a bunch of effects on my dad's business over time. It downscaled our lifestyle. So what I saw happen was our income, our one active income as a family went way down, um, big scale down. And so I was sitting there going like, huh, this is really hard to see this happen. And so I take those principles and lessons now, and I bring it up in this answering to your question, Peter, because when it comes to actually going out and thinking, how do, how do I draw on my energy? How do I draw on my past? How do I draw on my learnings of my upbringing or anyone else's upbringing that they have? I'm sure that they can find ways and reasons to go out and get the motivation to go do these things. But for me, that has been critical because in the end, I'm the dad now. Mm-hmm. I have young kids. I have people that rely on me. I know what happens if there's a single active income coming into a household and that income stops. So how do I build a financial moat around my family is the ultimate question that that guided me when I was trying to get to those early stages of goal setting. Um, and I think that that is so important for people is if they sit there and think a cup of coffee is not really getting me to the point where I can put together my ideal day, guys. And it's like, well, if your why is meaningful enough and you see what happens when things don't go well and you've painted a clear picture of what you know can go well, you'll find a little bit more pep in your step than just a cup of coffee. Man, dude, that's awesome. Like, and so I love, you know, you bring up the financial moat and I know that was an early, that, well, that, that was one of the big influences among other things, but I also love that you've really done that successfully while also prioritizing your health, your marriage, your family life, your, your kids, you know, like, and, and so it's your, your proof that this can happen. Like this actually can happen for people. Um, and so like, I, I just love that as an illustration, man. And um, um, 
I'm super happy for your success. You know, before we kind of like, before we kind of wrap the episode, are there any kind of parting words or advice you'd have for someone who's listening to this now um, that, and, and this could be from any, at any stage, whether they're, whether they're in their business and they're working too much, whether they have a job, like we talked about before, and they're, and they're thinking of making the jump and wondering if it's possible, whether they are, you know, living the life they want now and they have the, the freedom that they're pursuing, like, are there any kind of gems you've learned along the way that you just feel are, have become your kind of your life mantras or your, your, you know, your, 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 the, the mottos that you've kind of structured your, your life around? Yeah. Oh man, how much time do you have? I'll, I'll keep this, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll keep this quick. Um, two words that I'll share first that are powerful and the words how and the words yet. Uh, it, it, this was so helpful to hear this from a mentor. It was that anytime you think you cannot do something, just play out that phrase, you know, like instead of saying, you know, I want, can I go buy this property? Can I go start this business? Instead of that, say, how can I go start this business? And, and psychologically and for goal setting, that matters. It matters more than I, I ever thought it would. Uh, the word yet. <laughs> You know, if there's something that you want to achieve, just tack the word yet on the end of it, you know, and, 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 and make that a systematic habit, put a sticky note on your computer, put it up around your house. Um, you know, oh, I'm going to go, you know, help this number of people achieve financial freedom. Um, I want to do it until this period of time. Oh, I, I, I haven't done it yet. You know, uh, can I do it? Can I not do it? Uh, oh, I can do it. I just haven't done it yet. Um, Dude, it's everything. that is that is gold right there like i think that is a mic drop moment right there and i think <laughs> like i don't i don't know if there's anything else like more powerful that i've heard recently on one of our interviews than than those simple two words man no i really appreciate that i mean it, it, i can't take any credit for them obviously it's it's there's much wiser people who are like helping me always click up to the simple stuff you know like i'm, I'm i love overthinking i'm a champion overthinker <laughs> so you learned this from a yoda you have a yoda in life and like absolutely do. Don't think, yeah. just do. <laughs> yeah, ex exactly right. Yeah, man, we've been watching a lot of Star Wars. That's timely. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, but absolutely. Th th those words are quite powerful for me, and I hope they help other people. Well, dude, I feel super honored to have you on the show and really appreciate you sharing and dropping these gems for us. Where do people find out more about what you're doing and, and what you're into? Yeah, and thank you again, Jason and Peter. I mean, this has been a pleasure. Really honored to be on here. Um, so that you can find more about us at madisoninvesting.com. Um, we've got some information on there and folks can set up time to connect with me and we can just nerd out on investing or just you know talk about entrepreneurship. Love it. Thanks for your time, man. Yeah, thanks, guys. Man, I really enjoyed that interview, man. He's a super sharp guy. I love what he's accomplished. I love how he's prioritized his family and his health uh, above above work. And and frankly, man, I can relate a lot to his journey of like going down a path for a long period of time and then making a switch and realizing it's not the right path. You know, like I mentioned in the episode where I had to step away from a long, long pedigree of education to get into real estate. And he kind of had something similar. Now, certainly he's a lot sharper than I am. So, so he has well, yeah, five different companies that was involved at some point. You just right, went man. for five he's different legit. degrees. So, I mean, well, yeah, man. So, so I, this is a cool episode and I, you know, this is where I, there's a few nuggets that, that were some of my favorites. Like, you know, some of the first ones, and by the way, it's, it's so uncanny sometimes to me when we speak with these people who really, in many cases, don't even know who life in here is because mm -hmm. they're not in our niche. they, overlap so much with our beliefs and what we teach and our philosophies like it's just so cool it's such a validation that like independently you know people are realizing these things to be crucially important to their success and achieving freedom yeah so i mean i love what he talked about writing those goals and writing the perfect day vision like literally putting it down on paper and i tell this to all of my students put it down on paper there's something quote unquote powerful that happens when you do that. So I love that he brought that up. Um, I love the, you know, the two distinctions between the calendars that he talked about, you know? And the third thing about the calendar, where he actually went at the beginning when he was working and he went and created the calendar to find what hours that he has that are left over. He found 10 hours in his life that he can start um, giving to this new uh, business that he's building. And yeah. he had to be very 
authentic with himself, right? And being intentional that, you know what? Maybe I can go hang out with the friends like that. You know, maybe I need to drop the Netflix binging or whatever it might be, because that's when the 10 hours I can find. And when you go, and those are the kind of a intentionality that needs to be super duper important during that particular time in order to, for you to get off that ramp, you know, to get on the off ramp. And he basically kind of created himself. And I remember when well, I dude, asked yeah. him, like, so I get off the ramp because she was looking for one. He had to go create one. He had to build one. Because there right. is one, one in that kind of environment. So right. um, I love that he talked about that. Well, one thing I want to talk about for a second, man, is like, so there was this period in his life when he was like, you know, he's, he said he's up at four in the morning, he's working before work, he's working after work. And some people are like, well, hold on a second. How is that? How is that life in air ish? And how is that life in air esque? And how is that living in freedom? Here's the hard truth I think people sometimes gloss over is that when you're making any kind of transition like that, there is by necessity, a, a a period that is going to re a season that's going to require a little bit of extra work to get past that. Now, here's the, the big distinction, though. That extra work was just that. It was a season with an end goal that was moving him towards freedom. And the difference between that and just a W-2 is like that W-2 is purely active income that is not furthering the needle in terms of helping you create a business that's going to be sustainable. And so, uh, sorry, sorry, sustaining for your, for your, for your life. And so there's a difference there. And, you know, just like we have to, you know, be careful to monitor that because we don't want it to turn into like the next job. Like we don't want our business to all of a sudden like become our, what our W2 was and we're working 60, 80 hours a week. Um, that is kind of a transitional period that like early on, we talk about this by the way at the Business Builder Workshop where like, you know, you got to go through that first stage of, of business development where you're kind of doing more than you want to and you're learning and you're, you're getting proof of concept. And so you just got to buckle down for that, right? And just get through it as quickly as possible. Like you just got to, you know, you just got to get through it as quickly as possible, get to, through to the other side. Yeah, but you, to his point of what you're saying here too, I, there's got to be intentionality there and you got to have a plan to say that this is a season. I think a lot of people don't actually put the bookends on this yeah. kind of a thing to right. make sure that it's not a season. They're not being intentional, don't have a plan to, because what ends up happening- Or vision. It's, yeah, or vision, because what ends up happening is they get out of that, you know, working 80 hours for somebody else to get and working 80 hours for themselves and they become right. their all new worst boss because you know that season never ends basically. So that yep. season that we're talking about here should not be forever kind of a thing, right? So what's the plan that you need to set up? And I love how he brought it up because the nuggets that he dropped in there uh, were the things that helps you have the season be in a much smaller, um, you know, time then would yeah, normally you're it. help. Right. Yeah, you compress and it. Yeah. You're compressing that time period. And I and I and I'm glad that he also, you know, I had to ask him the question about the people that don't have a lot of money. They don't have a lot of capital. And so like what do those people do? And so I love that he addressed that. And then lastly, man, I just love these that we finished the episode on on a high note with these two words. Um how and yet. What a cool framework. And like two words to kind of give you some some context to any situation or challenge you may have. Like, right, like, how do I do this instead of I can't do this? And, you know, maybe, you know, I don't have the skills to do this. I don't yet have the skills to do this, you know? And so those two words, incorporating those into like some of the things that we think, that we say, um, really could have a transformative effect. Or I don't know how to grow hair yet. <laughs> Right. Maybe someday, right. Vojo. All someday, right. buddy. <laughs> I'm On that note, listen, we hope you guys enjoyed the episode. We hope you got something out of it. If you did, share this. Let somebody else know about the podcast. Like this is how we change lives around the world. You know, we are not limited to to our local area anymore. And this podcast can reach literally anybody from any corner of the earth, uh, which by the way, cool, man, uh, I, this is cool. I don't know if you knew this. We have a significant amount of uh, listeners like I've seen in Australia, in uh, the UK, and then uh, actually South Africa, we have actually gotten listeners there too. I'm like, what? this is kind of, yeah, like it's it's kind of weird. Um, I'm not seeing a Where lot of Polish Poland, though, man. Like I was gonna say, are you or have you been banned? Or like, are you on like the on the on the blacklist there? Like, what what's the deal there? Because we're not getting maybe, a lot of or I'm actually the one that's the, the detracting them from listening. Right. Yeah. So that's <laughs> yeah. I didn't want to say that. That's what I was kind of insinuating. But yeah. All right. Well, anyway, <laughs> share the podcast. Let somebody else know about it. Hope you got something out of it. We will see you next week. Take care, everyone.